for tonight. We're here in James chapter 3. It's good to be with you. Uh, I'm going to read verses 1 through 12. We may get through the whole chapter, hopefully, but at the very least, uh, we're going to get through this first section, Lord willing. I'm going to read verses 1 through 12. Uh, Let's first pray, and then we'll dive into God's Word together tonight. Lord, thank you for your Word as we are about to read here, and not only read, but hopefully apply to our lives. We thank you in advance for the work of your Holy Spirit, taking the truth of your word, translating it into our own hearts and lives that we might live it out for your glory. So help us now as we hear and read together and then to do what it says. And I thank you for all those who are here and those who are watching online. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing with our youth, middle school camp that just was completed and now the high school camp that is happening we just pray for our teens for the youth of our church that you will move in a mighty way lord in this generation we pray that you will move in a mighty way and we we thank you for our teens for our youth and just pray your hand upon them to guide them and to guard them and to use them for your glory for the kingdom's sake and we thank you for this time together in your word We honor you and glorify you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. James chapter 3, I'll read verse 1 through 12. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus, no spring yields both salt water and, fre- and fresh. And so we'll pause there for a moment. We come to the section here in the book of James. And, you know, the book of James is filled with uh, practical uh, points for how to live out your faith as a Christian. And we come now to a section of scripture here in James chapter 3, which doesn't really apply to any of us. I know. <laughs> I mean, it applies to the person next to you, but not you. Uh, We come to a section here having to do with the tongue or speech. And uh, I'm sure nobody here has ever said anything that you have regretted. Uh, I'm sure that you've always been perfect with your speech, that you've been careful with your words. But for the sake of the person sitting next to you, let's go ahead and take a look at this section together, shall we? Because words matter. This is what James is telling us here by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Words matter. It matters what you say and what you should not say. It matters how you say it and how you meant to say it. And it's not just spoken words that this text can be applied to. It's all forms of communication. I mean, you know, obviously James is writing around 50 AD, he's writing at a time when all they had was the spoken word and the written word. But 
They didn't have like newspapers and cell phones and they didn't have mass communications and satellites and all these kind of things. So for us today to understand James chapter three in its proper context, we need to realize that this applies not just to spoken communication, it applies to talk, text, tweet. You picking up what I'm dropping down? It applies to all forms of communication because words matter. They matter so much, take note, I'll just read it for you note takers, you can write down Matthew chapter 12, verses 34 to 37. You can turn there if you want, or you can just listen. Matthew 12, 34 to 37. Listen to what Jesus said about the importance of words. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you, that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For your, by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So Jesus had some pretty serious things here to say about speech in Matthew chapter 12. And I want you to hear again verse 37 that I just read that he said, for by your words you will be justified or acquitted, some translations say, and by your words you will be condemned. Now the first part of that verse is good news. We are justified by our words. And the Bible actually says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For it is with your mouth rather with your heart that you believe unto righteousness and is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So in Matthew 12, 37 there, when Jesus talks about by your words, you're either gonna be justified or condemned, the good news is you can be justified, you can be acquitted, you can be found not guilty by virtue of the supreme uh, confession, which is to acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And when you put your faith and trust in Christ, and when you surrender to him, and you confess your sins, and the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, then we are made right with him by virtue of that relationship that we have with Christ through faith. And so we come into that relationship, not just by what we believe. Remember, we talked about uh, uh, last time we were studying together about how even the demons believe and they tremble. But belief without behavior, in the case of James chapter 3, belief without confession, without saying something, without acknowledging with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, is just a, a set of belief in your heart, but it hasn't really been applied to a relationship. When I first got saved, I had grown up in the church, was exposed to, you know, the Bible and, and, and church, and that was just a regular thing we did as a family. But... I, had, I did not connect the dots and understand that it had to be a personal relationship with Christ. I just kind of thought you, you were a Christian because you go to church, which, you know, going to church does not make you a Christian any more than going to a donut shop makes you a cop. You know what I'm saying to you? And all my police friends, you know, don't ever like that joke, but you know what I'm saying. It's just like you, you, you're not something just because of where you visit. That doesn't make you, you know, a part of anything just because you visit there. But for, for years, I, I thought growing up, I was a Christian because I went to church. And then I go away on this youth retreat and, and this, the, the speaker at the youth retreat, just in a casual conversation with me, asked, are you a Christian? And I said, yeah. He says, how do you know you're going to heaven? I said, because I go to church. That was my answer. I go to church. And he said, that doesn't make you a Christian. I was like, what do you mean that doesn't make me a Christian? He says, no, and then he pointed me to Romans 10, 9, and 10, what I just quoted to you. If you believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead, and you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. He says, it seems to me that you have the belief part down. You believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead. Yeah. Have you ever confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? No. And so at that moment then, he led me in a prayer, I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord, and, and that's really when I got saved. Um, by your words, you will be justified. But Matthew 12, 37, the other part of that verse is, and by your words, you shall be condemned. In other words, there are things that we say that will be held against us. And by our words, we are acquitted and justified. And by our words, we bring condemnation on ourselves because words matter. And God, by the way, is listening to our words. 
and he is recording our conversations. All right, listen again to what Jesus said in a different passage. This is Luke 12, verses 2 and 3. Luke 12, verses 2 and 3. For there is nothing covered, or NIV says hidden, that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have spoken in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. In other words, God is taking record, he's taking note of what we say, even when we whisper it in the corners to one another. God hears. There's nothing hidden from God's ear. He hears it all, okay? He takes note of it. And there's, there's you know, th this, is, this is sobering stuff here in Luke 12 when he says, those things that are just whispered in the corner, they're going to be proclaimed from the housetops. So we better be aware of the things that we say, when we say it, how we say it, why we say it, what we say. So when you consider what Jesus says just in those two passages I quoted from Matthew 12 and Luke chapter 12, it's no wonder then that his half-brother, James, the one who was inspired to write this letter here, the half-brother of Jesus, is so adamant here about speech because he's heard from his half-brother some pretty serious stuff about our words. And so James here in chapter 3 uh, writes a, a strong imperative to instruct us concerning the tongue, concerning our speech. And chapter 3, by the way, is not his first reference to speech. Uh, jump back to chapter 1 in the book of James. Look at chapter 1, verse 19. In chapter 1, verse 19, he, he wrote this, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to what? Slow to speak and slow to wrath, slow to become angry. That's James 1, 19. Swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, slow to become angry. Somebody once said there's a reason why God gave us two ears and one mouth. Because God wants us to listen twice as much as he wants us to talk. We need to be good listeners, not talk as much. Talking gets us in trouble. Nobody ever got in trouble for, for biting their tongue. But plenty of people get in trouble for saying too much. I, I have a, a couple of quotes that uh, I always reference when we're talking about speech. But Abraham Lincoln once said, quote, better to keep your mouth shut and let people think you're a fool than to open your mouth and remove all their doubts. <laughs> and another quote by some anonymous author, even a fish wouldn't get in trouble if he kept his mouth shut. <laughs> think about, if, if you don't get that, you're not a fisherman, but anyway. <laughs> also here in James 1, look again in chapter 1, verse 26, he says something else about speech in James 1, 26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. So there's a great deal of emphasis uh, that James places here uh, on the importance of speech. Now back here in chapter 3, James says that the tongue in these first 12 verses has the potential to do four things. I'm going to put them on the screen for you. The tongue has the potential, number one, to condemn, number two, to control, number three, to contaminate, and number four, to contradict. We're going to look at these four things. The first one, to condemn. In verse one, he writes, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. I want you to notice with me here that James starts out by saying that people who teach God's Word, people like me, are more accountable to God than those who don't because of the sacred responsibility of rightly dividing the Word of God. And so he says here at the beginning of this chapter, not many of you should want to be teachers for this very reason because we're going to be judged more strictly those of us who have an awesome responsibility of the pulpit, or, or not just the pulpit, if you're in a teaching role in a Bible study, 
Maybe you lead a, a men's Bible study, a women's Bible study. Maybe you're teaching a K group. Maybe you're teaching a children's Sunday school class. If you're in a position of teaching the Word of God, whether voluntarily or whether as, you know, a, a livelihood, uh, it is an awesome responsibility and it should be a sobering thing to realize what we're entrusted with, the right dividing of the Word of God. And so he says in verse 1, not many people should want to be teachers. You're going to be judged more strictly. We'll be condemned for the mishandling of Scripture or the misspeaking of doctrine because it is a serious thing to misrepresent God and His Word. Now, that isn't to say that sometimes every teacher will you know, just accidentally say something that they didn't really intend. You know, there's been, there's been a few things, listen, in, in 30 years of ministry, I've said a few things like, that I, didn't, I don't remember saying that. Did I say that? That was a mistake. It wasn't intentional. You know, like, I, I'll just give you an example. So back at Christmas, um, and you know, we were doing multiple Christmas services. So somewhere halfway through like our seven services, I was a little brain dead, okay? Not, you know, I'm just saying, I'm not making an excuse, I'm just saying, all right? Little oxygen deprived. And so in the middle of one of the services, when I get up to make announcements, I'm welcoming new people, because a lot of times people only come to church at Christmas and Easter. So I'm like carefully wanting to make sure that people feel welcome. Like, hey, if you're here for the first time, this is your, 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 your first time here worshiping with us at Cornerstone, we're glad that you're here. And here's our regular service schedule. We hope that you'll come back and worship us. And I didn't even know I said that. And, and the video guys are like, did you know after that service, you, you said to the people, we hope you'll come back and worship us? I said, no. I said, I hope you'll come back and worship with us. They said, no, you left out the word with. I said, no. They got out the videotape. It didn't lie. I said, why don't you all come back and worship us? Worship us. What do you think all the new people are thinking? What kind of church is this? We, we go to Cornerstone and we worship each other? We, we, we worship that guy up there? What kind of church is it? It's a cult. It's a cult. Because I, I missed one word. One word can make a big difference between would you come back and worship with us and would you come back and worship us? That can make a big difference. And I couldn't go back and correct it because I didn't know I'd said that. But anyway, people can make some mistakes. People can say some things. They're like, oh, I, didn't, I didn't really mean to say that. But the idea here b behind verse 1 of chapter 3 is the mishandling of Scripture or doctrine as a regular failure. It invites God's judgment. So potential for our words to condemn us in a teaching role when we mishandle uh, God's Word or we misappropriate doctrine or somehow we misrepresent God, it's a, it's a sacred thing, it, and, and we need to take it seriously. So. Our words can condemn us. Number two on the list there, our words also have the potential to control. James says here that if you can control your tongue, if you can control what you say, you can control the rest of your body. It's an interesting principle. Look again at verse two. For we all stumble in many things. Okay, nobody's perfect. And if anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man. I mean, if you've never said anything that you regretted, you're perfect, okay? But that's not true because all of us have said things that we regretted. So we should strive for maturity. We should work to be like Jesus, but all of us have stumbled in saying something. But if anyone does not stumble in a word, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Notice that. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue. So in other words, in these verses, he's, he's saying a little thing like, for example, a bit controls a horse, and a little thing like a rudder, he says there in verse four, controls a ship. He says, a little thing like the tongue can control your whole body. In other words, what he says to us, if you can get your mouth in check, you can gain control over other areas of your life as well. I don't know if you've ever thought of it like that, but for some of you who you know, want to be more disciplined in certain areas of your life, 
Maybe it's discipline over food or discipline over um, maybe just um, sinful habits. Uh, maybe you want to be more disciplined over uh, your time. Um, how about starting with the discipline of controlling your tongue? Because it's interesting that what James says here is by way of principle, if we can reign in our tongue, if we can start there by controlling better what we say, how we say it, when we say it, it actually helps us to control the rest of what we struggle with in our bodies as well. It begins with our tongue. Proverbs 13, 3 says, he who guards his lips guards his life, but he who speaks rashly will come to ruin. But now notice that he also says in verse 8, if you just jump ahead to verse 8, he says, no man can tame the tongue. He says there in verse 8, no man can tame the tongue. Um, it is an unruly evil, he adds. It is full of deadly poison. So what he's telling us is that our speech is naturally going to be bent towards bad stuff, uh, evil things, and it's poisonous. So he says, we can't fix our mouth by ourselves, but God can. In other words, when he's saying there in verse eight, no man can tame the tongue, what he's saying is, therefore, we need God's help. Because through God's help in, in the taming of the tongue, it'll also help us to tame or control or to rein in other aspects of our lives. Uh, David understood this. David understood, man, I can't control my own speech. I need God's help, which is why he wrote in Psalm 141, verse 3, set a guard over my mouth, O Lord, keep watch over the door of my lips. That's a great verse. That's one of those verses maybe you should, you know, put it on a three by five card and put it on your mirror so every morning when you're brushing your teeth that you're reading that. Lord, put a guard over my mouth and keep watch over the door of my lips. And then thirdly, James tells us here that the tongue has the potential to contaminate, to contaminate. He says in verse five, even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles, there's the idea, contaminates the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. So he tells us here, hey, the, the tongue is poisonous, as if we didn't know that, right? It's a weapon. I mean, some people can wield the weapon of their tongue like nobody's business. I hope that doesn't describe you, but if it, if it doesn't already describe you, certainly we all know somebody who can wield the tongue like a weapon. And, and what he's saying here between verses five and six is just like a little spark can cause ra a raging forest fire, the smallest thing said can cause tremendous, terrible, even sometimes irreparable damage. Now, I want you to think about this because, again, I was being facetious at the beginning of our study. This applies to every single one of us. How many bad things said have divided friends, have hurt marriages, have ruined reputations, have destroyed careers, all kinds of things that we say regrettably have done great damage. He'll write a little bit further, jump to chapter four. He doesn't always write um, in, in, you know, a theme within a section. He kind of sprinkles it all through. And he also writes in chapter four, James does, in verses 11 and 12 about this very thing. Verse 11, do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. And there is only one lawgiver 
who was able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? So he says, be careful with your speech. Don't speak evil of one another. Here's a couple of references you can write in the margin of your Bible. 1 Peter 3.10. 1 Peter 3.10 says, For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. And how about this one? Proverbs 4.24 says, Put away perversity from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. The Bible has a lot to say about speech. And then number four... And the list here, the tongue has the potential to contradict. Not a good thing, but he's just telling us so in verses 9 through 12. Verse 9, with it, with it, with our tongue, we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude or the likeness of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. In other words, what he's saying is there should not be contradiction in our speech, where, whereby we come to church and we're singing praises and we're worshiping God with our tongue, and then we turn around and we're cursing out our neighbor. Or we're, or we're cursing at somebody as we're driving who cut us off. But James is like, as a Christian, listen, this should not be. You shouldn't be coming to church and worshiping God with the same mouth that you're cussing out people. He said, our speech should not be duplicitous like that. We should not be contradicting in our, in our speech. We should be careful that our tongue, our speech, is used to glorify God. We need to get rid of things like sarcasm, criticism, gossip, Slander, insults, lying, berating, cursing, manipulating, deceiving. I've hit myself a few times in the list. Anybody else? We ought to get rid of those things. Instead, we need to use our mouth to praise, encourage, inspire, warn, advise, teach, love, comfort, Bless, affirm, you know, there's a choice there. Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. You know, I, I've had people, and in one sense this doesn't bother me, in another sense it does, okay? Because in the one sense I think, they just don't know better. So, uh, you know, I want to have compassion for that because you know, I, I remember being a young Christian or before I was a Christian, didn't know better. But I've, I've actually had conversations with people in church where they've been talking to me and they didn't even realize they're cussing in the course of their conversation. Not at me. They're just retelling a story. And they're like, can you believe this? And the blankety blank thing and then the blankety blank and the blank. And I'm just standing, I'm like, are you not aware that A, we're in church, B, I'm your pastor? I mean, you know, I mean, just like... I don't say anything. I don't call them out. I'm just like, wow, you know, there's like, like zero self-awareness there. But at the same time, it makes me realize this is so common in your life, you don't even know you're doing it. This is so common, you don't even know you're doing it. And, and you know what, what I find sadly amusing is those very people who, who find that their common everyday vocabulary includes those words are the first parents who are astonished that their kid comes home in first grade and cusses like a sailor. They're like, I can't believe this. Where did they, where, oh my goodness, the public school system, you're going to get homeschooled. I hope not. Because <laughs> they'll learn more words with you than they did in the public school system. We, we, we just sometimes, you know, I, I, we've become so accustomed to, to our words, like not being checked. That it's like, come up, with, come up with words that are actually glorifying to God. You know, it's, I'm, I'm just, it's just funny to me in a sad kind of funny way. Um, look, sometimes undoing bad habits is, is hard. Um, but listen, get some new cuss words. 
I mean, get some, stop taking God's name in vain. And how about you just cuss using some false God? Stub your toe like a oh, sweet Dalai Lama, you know, or just like, <laughs> holy Buddha. I mean, just give some, use another name. Stop using God's name. Holy Buddha. That's an oxymoron right there. All right, so speech, that's the big deal that he talks about here in the first part of, of chapter three. And, and so let's look at the last few verses from chapter three about wisdom. Verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. The wisdom, this wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So now James has a few things to say in this closing third chapter about wisdom, and he differentiates between heavenly wisdom and earthly wisdom. He doesn't use the word heavenly wisdom. He talks about wisdom from above, but that's what he means. Wisdom that comes from God, wisdom that is from above versus earthly wisdom that he also says is sensual and demonic. Two types of wisdom here. And he, and he basically says here that earthly wisdom is when people are wise in their own eyes. And the fruit of that is envy and self-seeking, and IV says selfish ambition. And he, and he says it is sensual or unspiritual and demonic there in verse 15. So earthly wisdom presents as being envious, unspiritual, earthly, demonic. Um, envious, what's the difference between envy and jealousy? Envy is basically coveting what someone else has. Jealousy is being bitter over what someone else has, okay? I'll say it again, envy is coveting what someone else has, you want it. To be jealous is to be bitter that they have it. And so he says here, there, there's this um, characteristic of earthly wisdom that presents with envy and selfish ambition or self-seeking. Uh, whereas heavenly wisdom or wisdom that is from above is evident in the life of an individual by fruit. There's going to be evidence here. And he, and he lists eight things. Uh, he says it'll be evidenced by the fact that on display in your life is that you're pure, that you're peaceable, that you're gentle, that you're willing to yield full of mercy, full of good fruit, uh, without partiality or impartial and uh, without hypocrisy or sincere. So on, on the one hand, he describes a person who thinks he is wise, that's earthly wisdom, but who is envious and self-seeking. So it, it's the idea of, you know, someone who was never content, they're covetous, they're always trying to get ahead at the expense of other people. They're making decisions that benefit self over others. And James says people might call that wisdom because those people, they get some results. Uh, they get ahead. Uh, but it's really, James says here, it's really earthly, sensual, and demonic because God is not just concerned about the ultimate destination that you and I try to arrive at. God is also concerned about the journey. He's concerned about how you lived, how you achieved, how you related to people along the way is more important to God than just getting there. In Isaiah 5 verse 21, Isaiah says, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. 
People can be clever and people can be manipulative and deceptive and inch their way towards success. And people will marvel at their, quote, wisdom when they see the end result, but God is not impressed. It is not wisdom at all, James says. He says it's unspiritual, it's demonic. And he says, and where you have that sort of wisdom, you have confusion and you have every evil thing in verse 16. But he says, on the other hand, he says, then there's, there's wisdom from above and that we should exercise wisdom from above. And it will manifest itself in those eight ways. Look at the list again. It manifests itself in eight ways. Verse 17, pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield. Some translations say submissive, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. So stop and ask yourself, do these things mark my life? If they do, you're probably walking in the wisdom from above. If they don't, then where are you getting your wisdom from? In Proverbs 4, verse 7, it says, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. Now, at this point, you're thinking, well, how do I get that kind of wisdom? And the answer is back in James chapter 1. Look at James chapter 1. He's going to tell us in verse 5. How do you get this wisdom from above? And all of us, I'm going to ask this question. You don't need to raise your hand, but every single one of us should raise our hand. How many of you could use a little more wisdom from above, right? And so James tells us in James 1 verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. It'll be given to him. God promises, I'll give you wisdom, just ask. But then there's a caution in verse 6, but let him ask in faith and with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And so no better way to close our service than to pray for wisdom and then to believe in response to God's word that he will give you the wisdom that you need. And at the same time, we're also going to pray, may God set a guard over the door of our mouths and may he help us to guard our tongues. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we come together tonight as we close out James chapter 3 and we want to just personally reflect and we start, Lord, with our tongue because we know that our words can either do wonderful things or cause great damage. Help us, Lord, to guard our speech. We pray Psalm 141, verse 3, set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Help us, Lord, to replace things like sarcasm or criticism or berating people or deceiving or lying. Replace those things, Lord. May we be conscious in our lives to replace those things with blessing people, honoring people, encouraging people, blessing people. Put a guard over the door of our mouths, Lord. Forgive our nasty speech. Forgive, Lord, the things that we have said that have not only dishonored others, but have dishonored you. And help us, Lord, to be disciplined with our speech. And finally, Lord, we pray for your wisdom from above. All of us go through different things and we need your wisdom on a daily basis. And so we stand on James 1.5, that if we simply ask, you will give it to us. And we don't doubt it, Lord. We receive it by faith that you would pour out your wisdom into our hearts and our lives, that we would receive the wisdom from above that we would not walk in earthly wisdom, the things that man thinks is smart or wise in, in his own eyes, 
but we would walk in the wisdom of the Lord, that you would rain down from heaven your wisdom from above. And we thank you by faith that you give it to us because we believe and receive in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.